This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Stories influence, teach, and inspire us. But what about the storytellers who create them? Uncorking a Story profiles storytellers to uncover how their background and life experiences influence the stories they create. We learn what motivates them, their path to success, and what fuels them to keep creating. It all starts by asking one simple question, where does your story begin? Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Now here's your host, Mike Carlin. Well, hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm pleased to introduce you to Shannon Duncan. Shannon is an entrepreneur and the author of Present Moment Awareness. He lives in California, finding his way to an authentic expression of himself, including and especially his sense of humor, which has been the most rewarding aspect of healing from trauma. He joins me today on Uncorking a Story to discuss his latest, his latest book, Coming Full Circle, Healing Trauma Using Psychedelics. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, Shannon. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm happy to have you here, Shannon. I'm, I'm going to ask you the question I ask all my author guests, which is, where does your story as an author begin? Um, my story as an author begins with my first book, Present Moment Awareness, which I just re-released for its 20th anniversary, um, which was pretty fun. Um, and in it, I was describing my own process at the time for becoming more self-aware and more trying to live more present in the moment. And, you know, my writing style is to take complex topics and make them very, uh, very, very approachable. Or, you know, get it down to the simplest thing that it can be. And uh, that's uh, that's what shines through in present moment awareness. What what prompted you to to write that book? And, and what were you doing before you were an author? Uh, um, what prompted me to write that book was I was in the process of learning and growing intensely through that through that time period. And I wanted to share what I had learned and what had come what was uh, helpful for me at that time. Uh, Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, was uh, really big back then. And I, I liked the book a lot, and I went to hear him speak. Um, but I noticed in myself and with others that there there was a felt sense of a lack of a pragmatic approach with it. And so I wanted to put out something that was very pragmatic. And interestingly, the whole idea for the book started around this little device back before smartphones or anything. Um, it was looked like a little triangular pager. It was called the focus tool and it would go off randomly between 20 minutes and two hours apart and you just wear it and keep it with you and bring yourself back into the moment whenever it alerts. And uh, that book was uh, started off as the instruction manual for it and it just kept growing until it became its own book. <laughs> he had the concept of the pain body. Is that anything you're familiar with or Eckhart Tolle? Um, I remember him talking about the pain body. Um, I I view it more as uh, how we hold traumas in our in our in our body in our and in our psyche. Yeah, yeah. That was it. Was one of those things that I had a hard time grasping because um, yeah. I went through a uh, this sort of you know five day intensive out in California uh, earlier this summer, and you know part of our curriculum at, at night was to to get together as a group and we. We're reading about the pain body. It was the first time I'd ever been exposed to that concept. And I'm like, wow, this this actually, you know, it's it it makes a lot of sense to me. You know, you know, we we hold physical pain, you know, in our in our limbs or our muscles. Why not why not have some kind of, you know, mental pain or emotional pain that that we're all walking around with as well? So I was I was just kind of fascinated by that. And I just remember that was the first time I was exposed to a cartole and it was um it was kind of a life changing experience to be honest yeah it's actually been it's actually been proven that trauma is stored in the body you know all all emotion is physical sensation and it's physical sensation that your mind interprets to figure out you know it's kind of what helps guide you through life it's like our sonar system of guiding through life or how how our brain is triggered to make us feel and when traumas are experienced their experience is overwhelming and the feelings are perceived as a threat and so the psyche locks those away in the body and the process of healing comes from being able to navigate in and give expression to those things and giving yourself an experience of not not being damaged or harmed by having felt them right it's a corrective experience yeah hey, you know it's it's also interesting to me like the way our minds interpret or you know or or send us signals um around 
either feeling anxious or feeling excited because there's like a fine line between the two. It's almost the same physical sensation, that feeling of like butterflies in the stomach. You know, mm-hmm. um, I'm a I'm a runner. And, you know, I, I follow this training program and, and the coach is always saying, hey, look, if you're excited at the starting line, it's the same feeling as being nervous. It's all how you channel that is, is really going to you know, impact how, how you run a certain race. Um, so I'm, I'm just fascinated by all that stuff. Yeah, me too. Um, well, let's talk about uh, this, uh, this new book, um, which, of course, is uh, coming full circle, Healing Trauma Using Psychedelics. Just walk me through the the backstory behind behind this book. Sure. Um, you know, I uh, like like many people, I had some uh, uh, pretty intense early childhood trauma, and um, some of it I wasn't even aware of. And I struggled in my early life into adulthood with symptoms of complex PTSD, but I didn't know that that's what it was. Um, later, I would be again and again diagnosed as having depression, which I did not. Um, <clears throat> And I tried a lot of approaches to healing, uh, including talk therapy and traditional therapy and body-centered therapies, hypnotherapy. Um, And those did indeed help. My self-awareness grew incredibly, um, but I didn't get into the core of my issues. I wasn't getting into the heart of it. Um, I experimented with psychedelics on my own. Um, After the first time I was introduced to psychedelics, I realized how powerful the self-reflective nature was, how I could see myself from different ways and learn and grow in that way. And so I was really excited to explore. Um, Rarely, rarely just for fun. Um, And they can be fun. I don't have a problem with that. But for me, it was about the exploration. Um, But it was when I was introduced to somebody to do my first professionally guided psychedelic session that it just blew my doors off. It cracked me open like an egg. I let out pain. Basically, I came out of it just sobbing for like half an hour. I was just releasing in a way that I had never in my entire life released stuff. And that's where I started to realize that, wow, psychedelics can be used in a very different way. The same medicine, the same dose. You approach it with a different mindset. It's held in a different way. You, you, you're, you uh, behave in a different way during it instead of being out and checking out plants and looking at what's trippy. You're in a room and it's quiet or you've got soft music and you're on a comfortable mat and it's usually eye shades. Um, And so it really focuses it inwards and deep and it's profound how deeply it can reach. And that started a four-year process for me of regularly going through psychedelic healing work that has left me so fundamentally changed compared to where I started. Um, I, I have actual joy in my life. I have the ability to actually connect with other human beings in ways that it were just impossible for me before. It's um, and it's enduring. These are these aren't the the psychedelic healing work isn't about addressing symptoms. It's about healing the source of the symptoms, and it it, it's, it makes all the difference once you understand how that works. And sharing my process of what I went through and what I learned and what to watch out for and what to look for is what I wanted to share in coming full circle. So it's a, it's a memoir, but it's also an informative guide and it's all kind of woven together. Um, so you follow my story while you're learning these concepts so you can make an informed decision for yourself if this is something you want to investigate further. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting, just kind of going back to, you know, you talking about experiencing PTSD. I think there's some misconceptions about that, which is, you know, because, of course, it used to be called shell shock, you know, after the First World War, um, you know, that that it's something that only people who have been through, like the super traumatic, you know, war experiences, you know, seeing your, you know, your, your, uh, your, your fellow soldiers like being blown up in front of you. Yeah, but, of course, you know, PTSD can also, you know, manifest itself from, you know, significant, um, serious emotional traumas as well. You know, not not seeing blood and guts, but like, you know, the, you know, it's some kind of abuse. So, you know, it's just, you know, just curious to me that you kind of came to this, you know, I guess, revelation that, hey, you're you're suffering from PTSD, but you're not a soldier. I mean, I don't know if that's your backstory, but. Um, I'm assuming. Um, yeah. So there's there's an important a couple of important distinctions between trauma 
and PTSD. And PTSD is a very intense, it's, it's caused by something very intensive, emotionally intensive happening. And that very often happens in war. The, the, the perpetual sense of being ready to die is, is usually the impetus or severely traumatic events because you can have trauma that needs to heal and not have PTSD. And what I actually was working with was what's called complex PTSD. And instead of being caused by a single giant traumatic event or a couple of events close together, it happens over time. So childhood abuse commonly creates complex PTSD, just time after time after time accumulating on top of itself, uh, spouse, spousal abuse. People in prison often have complex PTSD, just the constant threat of violence or being subjected to violence. Um, and their symptoms are really, really similar. There's some differences between the two, but they are very, very similar. And so what I was working through was the complex PTSD, um, which caused massive swings into what were labeled as depression. It was actually something a little different. Um, suicide ideation, just an inability to connect with other human beings, um, really, really profound life diminishing um, symptoms that have they're not a hundred percent gone. I'll always, I'll always carry some scars from my background, but it is radically different than it was before. Yeah. Let me talk about kind of going to talk therapy, which, which I am a proponent of, I think if, if done right, it, it, it works very well. Um, but you know, it, it's a long process. Um, it, um, and, and I always wonder if it's intentionally a long process, you know, to, 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 have, have therapists keep patients longer, but that's, you know, neither here nor there. I, I want to understand like how you came to exploring psychedelics as a healing, um, as an option for healing from trauma. Cause it sounds like you were kind of, you know, maybe investigating them or, or experimenting them recreationally at yeah. one point in your life. Um, yeah. but talk to me about like how, how you came to them, you know, for, for treatment. Sure. I, um, I was in my late, mid to late forties, I was really going through a dark period. A lot of su suicide ideation, just, I was really shutting down, pulling back from all my friends. Um, it was, it was a very dark time and a friend recommended, um, somebody who was doing, um, guided sessions. It was a group thing, but the actual work you did was one-on-one. -on -one. We met as a group and then each of us had an experience. And that was with a drug called 5-MeO-DMT, really potent. It's uh, by weight, I believe, to be the most uh, powerful psychedelic on the planet. Um, 15 milligrams of the synthetic or 50 milligrams of the organic version of it inhaled in less than a minute launches you as high as you've ever been in your life. And a lot of people don't even re remember the peak of that experience, but it opens you up so deeply and so profoundly. It just, it, you just start releasing. <laughs> and so I had this experience and I came back from it. And then for like half an hour, I was just sobbing in a way that I have not sobbed in my life ever. I was just releasing. And I knew then that this different way of sitting with psychedelics and having somebody really qualified there to help guide it was going to be my ticket for healing. Because if I could, in this just first try, have this kind of profound release, I knew I could go deeper and deeper unearth these things from myself and hopefully have a very different experience of life to what I had always known before. And it, it turned out to be absolutely true. See, see that would scare the shit out of me. It, um, it should. It <laughs> scared the shit out of me. <laughs> you know, because just hearing you talk about it, it's like, okay, so, so, you know, for, for all transparency, I'm square. Like as probably one of the most square people you'll ever meet in your life, you know, never went through the whole Grateful Dead slash fish phase. Yeah. You know, where I'm going to con concerts, you know, tripping my balls off or anything. But yeah, sure. um, just the notion of like losing that control for a while um, is, you know, I, it would certainly cause me to, to some some trepidation. It, it, it uh, in most of my early guided sessions, working with even working with medicines like MDMA or ecstasy, where fear is never really a factor. I was always really scared before because my body knew I was going to be releasing control over things that it had been trying to protect me from since I was a kid, right? You know, these things happened to me 
And the feelings then were so intense, I thought I might die. And so my body locked that away. And reopening that brought all that old fear up. But with the proper guidance, I was reminded to keep breathing, breathe from your belly and relax the body and doing some body work and just let it flow. And the fear eventually just releases. It just flows through you. And then the underlying material, you cry or you, you, you let it go in some way. And then you're done. That, that part doesn't really, I mean, sometimes you have to revisit things a few times going deeper and deeper to fully get it, but you, you genuinely release these things. You're not, it's not letting off steam. It's not letting off steam to feel better for a little while. It's healing the, the source of the heat of that steam. So you feel better for good. And it, it is, it's, it's truly incredible how it works. And it's just, it's, it's intelligence that makes it scary. Because yeah. you, because on some level, even if it's unconscious, you know that there's stuff that's just that feels too scary to feel, but that's just on the outside looking in. Once you're inside, it's all completely manageable. It's all fine, and it's crossing that threshold and really having it more important to heal than it is to sh shy away. And that's that's really the thing that that, that carries you through. So I guess it, you know the. It works by helping you really dig into your your subconscious, which, you know, which is, you know, maybe where all this pain and this trauma is actually being held because the body remembers or I think there's a book out there, right? The body, the body keeps, keeps the, score, the score, right? Um, the body, even if you, you consciously try and forget it, the, the body will remember. And I don't know how much talk therapy can actually get to you know, that subconscious level. And, and I know you also mentioned hypnosis, which is something I've experimented with as well. But I think, you know, for many of us who are kind of resistant to it, um, you know, it may not be all that helpful. So is 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 really, are these psychedelics just a way of unlocking or is it like the gateway or the door to the unconscious or the subconscious? Yeah, that is that is exactly that is exactly how I view it. The, the psychedelics is not about the visuals or tripping out, and, and that's fun. I'm not putting that down at all. I've had great times hanging out with friends, camping, and you know we're all tripping balls around a campfire and just enjoying each other's <laughs> company, and it's a great time. It is it is a beautiful use for for psychedelics, but in the healing work, I never notice visuals or anything like that. It's all what it's opening up in me. Emotion is physical sensation moving through the body. And it really helps you to open it. So it gives you access to yourself. And you mentioned gateways. They aren't the gateways, but what they do is give you access to the gateway. So gateways are the points of resistance that try to keep you out. And so you come up and you feel it and you let it, you breathe into it and let it expand and open. And when it releases, then you get access to the next gateway and you work your way in. Yeah, no, I, I, it's fascinating. And I think like the setting being so different, you know, you know, versus the campfire or versus, you know, the, you know, the dead show or whatever. Um, well, you have, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 please. Well, you've probably heard the old term bad trips. Sure. You know, somebody has a bad trip and they freak out and they can traumatize themselves. And, and my experience has been, and, and, you know, granted, I'm not the end all be all expert about everything, but my experience has been that bad trips happen. What people label as bad trips when deep emotional material starts to come up on psychedelics and um, and you don't know that that's what it is. You just feel all this fear. And so when you've got all this fear coming up, your mind's still trying to avoid the deep, deeper emotional material. So you go into like paranoid fantasies or imagining terrible things or deep into paranoia. And that's, that's what that bad trip is. But in guided psychedelic therapy work, it's actually the pay dirt you're looking for. That's your mm. way to go in deeper. But instead of it being a big traumatic thing, you feel some fear and you keep breathing and you keep letting it move through you and it just releases and, and comes past, it just flows right through you. And then you get access to whatever it was it was trying to push you away from. Yeah. And I, I guess that maybe the difference is, and you tell me what you think about this, when you're in a protected setting, you know, when, when you're in a comfortable setting and you've got somebody there reassuring you and you're going through that, what would have been labeled as a bad trip? Um, you know, versus having that experience when you're at a festival and there's a lot of sound and there's a lot of mayhem, you know, you, you can easily yeah. see where you'd be, you'd be frazzled. But it sounds like that's what you're looking for in that more safe, protected setting. Yeah, it is, you know, it's not a bad trip in that setting because the feelings are expected and they're actually welcomed and, you know, welcomed with some trepidation, but welcomed uh, because 
it's the outside looking in and resisting that makes it harder, but just with the breathing and with the encouragement, you just, you release it and it lets you go in deeper and you get to learn more about yourself and you get to release old pains and uh, you get to move towards a greatly improved experience of life. Right. So it's, in a way, it's not the psychedelics that are healing you. It's the, re it's the releasing of the pain that they let you do that is healing for you. Yeah, it's the, um, you, you, psychedelics give you access to heal yourself. My very first guide that I worked with, he, one of the first things he said to me was, when you cut your arm, your body knows how to heal it. You don't have to do anything. Your body knows how to heal you emotionally too, if you'll let it. And letting it is releasing the resistance, releasing the resistance, releasing your psychological fear of experiencing those emotional states allows them to because what they were meant to do was you feel these feelings and they motivate you to run away or do whatever you need to do, but instead they get locked down. So it restores their natural free flowing state and you no longer have to resist or protect against possibly feeling that again in the future. And that's, uh, that's the healing process in, with this. And, it's, and, and just to be clear, it's, it's not something you can just jump into. Was, people would need, if, if you don't have a lot of time or self-awareness, or you don't have a lot of tolerance for your own emotional states, then getting some therapy before. Some, some guides will require six months of therapy before you're even allowed to, to try your first journey because you need to be mentally and emotionally prepared to go through the process. And then you also need support after in what's called the integration period because emotions still keep churning up. You might have memories bubbling up. It can be really intense sometimes. And so having good support and somebody to talk to and a game plan for when things get intense and that's just, that's the, that's the span of the healing process with it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I was thinking just as you were talking about that, um, of, I think it was a story. It may have been on 60 minutes or 2020 or one of those evening news programs where they were talking about psychedelics as a tool for treating alcoholism and other chemical dependencies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, what 15 minute news segment, maybe. And they were talking to somebody who went through the treatment. They said, you know, after one treatment, it just I didn't have any need, desire, um, feeling that I needed to drink anymore. Um, and, you know, I'm wondering, is 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 it working the same way? Is it is it really helping, you know, the person tackle the reason why they were you know kind of turning to alcohol or drugs? Um, helping them relieve that, and therefore the body doesn't crave it anymore. Um, you know, I I don't have direct experience with that. Um, I know anecdotal stories. I've spoken to people who offer those kinds of services. Um, sometimes people have those reprieves, and it returns later because the underlying reasons why they use those substances to hide from their own emotional states returns. Um, it's kind of like the ketamine treatments for, um, for depression. You know, as long as people keep getting them, they seem to see a reprieve from their depression. But as soon as they stop getting them, it tends to return. And so it's more symptom management than actual healing. And I don't, I don't know what the score is on, you know, that person that felt like they had uh, a great re uh, a great um, shift from their addictive behavior. I'd love to hear what happened to them a year and two years out after that. Um, it 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 could be. I've I've you know I've heard that like ibogaine can reset the neuroreceptors that that crave um, that crave um, opioids, and people have had a huge huge um, success with opioid withdrawal, uh, with ibogaine. But again, I don't, I don't have pre pre personal experience with it. So I try not to speak as an expert about those things. Yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, people you know, hearing this, uh, who will eventually read your book, um, any advice for them in terms of like where, you know, if, if somebody were looking to, you know, turn to psychedelics, uh, as a treatment of, of healing for healing trauma, what's the first piece of advice you might give somebody? What's the first piece of advice you need? You need deeply qualified support. That support may come in legally sanctioned um, clinical trials or legally sanctioned treatment. Like um, Oregon has new programs for uh, practitioners to utilize mushrooms to treat people. Um, although I absolutely do not agree with how they're rolling it out. And it's, it, it's, it's, 
it's the practitioners are really shackled and some of them are only going through a certification process. And it's just, there's some deep misunderstandings around how it's what happens when bureaucrats get a hold of something like this, right? There's just deep misunderstandings on how psychedelics are used for healing and they can't get out of the mindset. Well, you take an antibiotic and it gets rid of the bacteria and then you're better. Take a psychedelic and it gets rid of something and then you feel better. And it just, it doesn't work that way. And so, um, there's an organization called MAPS, and that's the they've been spearheading since the 80s getting um, psychedelics legal for clinical use for treating for treating uh, post traumatic stress disorder. And they, they were using they're leading that with veterans and with great success. Um, so somebody could look to MAPS for a place, um, but a lot of it is still in the gray market. A lot of it's still in the gray area where you have people that are highly trained and many are therapists deeply experienced in dealing with trauma and they've moved, they've done their own deep work on psychedelics so they can come and hold a space for somebody to process their own trauma that's that's the route i took that's what worked for me um, and i talk at length in the book about how to identify somebody who's qualified to do that or not because as you can imagine in the gray market there are quite a few people that think they know what they're doing that have no idea what they're doing and it's, yeah. they're, they're dangerous and so I talk a lot about in the book of what real help looks like, what kind of questions you can ask this person to, to, to start sorting out if they know what they're talking about or not, and really just trying to empower somebody to understand what the process really is and how to get good help. Is there a backstory to the painting behind your right shoulder? Oh, um, yeah, that was a friend of a friend. He's a, he's a pretty famous surf painter alex lanau i think he lives down in costa rica now and he painted that for me it's i just love that picture and it's it was either that or my piano in the background so i chose the picture today <laughs> <laughs> no it's nice i like it i like it certainly yeah, uh yeah um well one of the things i like to do with my guests is to get to know them a little bit more one one way i do that is through pop culture so I have a few questions for you along those lines shannon uh when you were growing up what were some of your favorite tv shows Anything to do with space, Star Trek, of course, I was a, not a TV show, but I was a massive Star Wars fan. I just loved anything to do with that. Um, it would be not so PC now, but I, I remember liking the Dukes of Hazzard. You know, I didn't, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't didn't, think I they can get away with it generally the, now. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know anything about the flag on the roof or anything. It was just cool watching the car fly through the air and those guys. Yeah. Or or any episode where they got to bust out the bow and arrows from the trunk, uh, oh, like, yeah, yeah, and yeah, maybe they light them on fire. You know, exactly. to me, that would be, that would be cool. Do, do you oh, have a night? Night Rider was a big one too. I really like that. <laughs> I think we we might be the same age. Um, yeah. Do, do you have a favorite episode of Star Trek that stands out to you? Gosh, I haven't gone back and rewatched any in so long. I don't think so. I think they all kind of blur together now for me. It's there was been a while one, since I've gone back and checked. There was one where I think it was called Wolf in the Fold, where um, they go into some Class M planet, and it's like a Jack the Ripper story, and somehow Scotty, um, Mister Scott, is like fingered for being like the Jack the Ripper of <laughs> this planet. It's it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, most of the episodes were. I don't remember that one at all. Oh yeah, no, go look it up. It's called Wolf in the Fold. Um, I would like to. Yeah. 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 Very good. How about music? What did you like listening to growing up? Oh man, once I discovered what back then was considered heavy metal, like hair band metal, I just loved it. Ozzy Osbourne, Van Halen, Iron Maiden. Yeah, I was I was all about that. I I had curly hair, so I couldn't have like like cool long guy long hair. I just had a more of a fuzzy mullet, <laughs> but I so badly wanted long hair like the cool guys. <laughs> right. So I have to ask, uh, thinking about Van Halen, since you invoked their name, uh, Sammy or Dave or Gary, if you want to throw Gary Sharon in there. Dave. Yeah, I think that's the safe answer, right? He's the first lead singer. Um, well, that's, that was, that was the, that was the music I really liked. And yeah. after that, it started feeling a little poppy. It did get a little poppy with, with Eddie, but even with 1984, when, when Eddie started playing keyboards more, 
Um, you know, Jump is a song that I detest. I will turn it off every time I hear it. Yeah. Um, but I, I like some of the Sammy stuff. I'm not going to lie. Like 50 by 50 has got some quality songs on there. Yeah, he had a gorgeous voice. And I'm, I'm not saying I didn't like that music, but if I could yeah. only choose to listen to one generation of Van Halen or the other, I'd take the, the David Lee Roth. Yeah, no, I hear if if I yeah. if you put a gun in my head and, and and said, "Hey, would you like to see Van Halen in '78 or Van Halen in '92?" I would I would pick '78. '78, yeah, I would pick '78. Yeah. Um, okay, one last pop culture question: movie. Uh, you have a favorite movie or one of your favorite movies? Oh, that's a great question. I've been going back through with a friend who's missed a lot of the classic movies over the years, so we meet up every couple of weeks and watch one together. Um. A movie that was very moving for me as a kid was First Blood, actually. This character that just felt uh, beleaguered and judged and unwanted. And, he, you know, he ends up getting revenge in the end. And there's just something about that really, really spoke to me. I really felt his pain in that movie. And I've always, you know, I go back and look at it with new eyes and I can see it's a little cornball in places. But it's still a pretty good movie compared to the ones that came after it. Oh, my um, gosh. So it's like, first of all, you hate, you hate you know, what was his name? Brian Dennehy and anything else you ever see him in because you remember him as the the bad sheriff in, in First Blood. Yeah. But it's interesting because they 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 take the tone of that character and they make him an action star in, you know, First Blood 2, 3, 4 or whatever. I think they're up to yeah, five they maybe. It, right? And it's so freaking different, you know? It's yeah. uh, a it's, it's very, very different movie. Um, but if I had to, if I had to say just throughout my life, the, one of the most motivational movies or one of the most movies that has affected me the most, it'd be Star Wars or Empire Strikes Back. And just those, I just, I, I was so in love with those movies. My first heartache ever was over Princess Leia. So I just, I remember my mom taking me to those movies when I was a kid. I was just so deeply moved by all of it. It was just incredible. So yeah. There's certainly better and different movies that I've watched since, but those those I'll always remember fondly. Yeah, but those first three movies or four, five, and six, um, you know, I, I look at the ones that that they made as prequels, and I look at the ones that came after, and something's missing, right? Something's missing from that original storytelling. I can't put my well, I can put my finger on it, but. This isn't well, did a movie. You, did you see Rogue One? Because I love Rogue One. Yeah, something of it came back for Rogue One. I loved and, Rogue and, One and the recent the recent series Andor. Andor was fantastic. Too. Both of those were great. And yeah, I, you know, the Mandalorian's pretty good too. Um, yeah, it's okay. It's 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 fun. I like watching the little baby Yoda guy. But yeah, he's uh, cute. <laughs> Rogu. Um, yeah, there's. Um, I, I I think where Rogue One and Andor really stepped it up is they made it for the people that watched the stuff as kids, but they made it a little more grown up for us to enjoy it more now. Yeah. Whereas Mandalorian's more for kids maybe again, and I can't quite relate to it like I did. And so I don't know. I just, yeah, I like, I like that stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, final question as we wrap up here, um, I, I like to call it Dear Younger Me. So if you were able to uh, write a letter to your younger self, uh Shannon what would you what would you tell your younger self in a letter entitled dear younger me that's that is a great question and in the in the light of you know what i talk about in coming full circle if i could it's like you know what man you are worthy of love and these things aren't your fault and one day life's going to be better that's what I would let him know. Yeah, give him give him a little reassurance. Yeah. All right. The beautiful sentiment. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, where can people buy uh, Coming Full Circle, Healing, Trauma, Using Psychedelics? Uh, Amazon is easy. It's there in print, ebook, and uh, audiobook, which I went to a studio and recorded myself. That was uh, exhausting and fun at the same time. It came out really, really good. Um. Uh, any bookseller can get it. I don't think a lot of bookstores are carrying it. The ebook is widely available in all kinds of outlets, and the the audio book will be soon. Um, the print book it'd be great if bookstores are carrying it, but it's pretty hard to get into bookstores nowadays. Yeah, um, but I'm sure um, if you went to bookstore... an independent bookstore and and somebody asked for it, they could probably get it for you. Yeah, you can walk into any bookstore. It's in the in the Ingram distrib distribution network, so any bookstore can order it and get it for you. Um, or you can have it, you know, in a day or two from Amazon. 
And um, yeah. Very good. And Shannon, if people want to get a hold of you, I know you've got a website, shannonduncan.com, but do you have any uh, social media that you're active on? You want to share any uh, of your social social media profiles? Um, I've got a profile on LinkedIn that I mostly use to network out to others in the psychedelic healing industry, in the healing scene. I've just, I'm always trying to learn more about it and see how I can help. Um, so I am on LinkedIn and you know, I've got a Facebook profile, but honestly, I do next to nothing with it. I've been away from social media completely for over 15 years, and I only came back because my PR person insisted that I get on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, and so I just, I copy and paste stuff from LinkedIn over to Facebook, and I just really, I just, it's such a toxic environment. I don't want to participate, so it's not a good way to reach me. Um, LinkedIn's a fine way to reach me, or you can use a contact form on my website. I, I do my best to respond to anyone that doesn't feel like a troll <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, I'll help where I can. Very good. Well, I'll be sure to put your website and your LinkedIn link in our show notes. So people don't have to scribble them down right now. Uh, okay. Shannon, thank you for stopping by uncorking a story and letting me uncork yours. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It was, it was a good show. Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story.